Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and we have Risa Gru. She's a functional nutritionist and a practitioner private practice out in Newport Beach, California, and she's always been passionate about nutrition and good health, and so we've got some exciting things that we're going to talk about today. So, Risa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, tell us a little bit about what food frame is. So, you say that diet is a four-letter word, but you kind of go on the food frame method. Tell us what that is. So I've been in private practice, as you mentioned, for so long, and I meet with so many people of all different types. I work with professional athletes, college athletes, regular people, kids, teenagers, and everybody needs to eat differently is what I've discovered, right? So we all, people will walk into my office time after time. I've been on keto and I can't lose weight and my neighbor lost 45 pounds on keto and, (laughs) you know, and, and right. You've heard that before, right? Uh Yeah. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. And so I, I believe, and I am proven right every day that one diet does not fit for all. So we have to eat according to our health status. So what I developed after all the years of experience and seeing people's different needs is that everybody has a different health status. So if you have autoimmunity, you need to eat for your autoimmunity. If you have um, SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, or you have irritable bowel syndrome, you need to eat according to that health status. So not every diet is for every person. So what I did is develop the food frame. And basically you take a quiz online on my website at risagrunutrition.com or, um, you know, or you work with me and we would discover what your health status is. And then you eat according to that. Um, and then your your body will respond to that because we're we're looking at the roots of it, right? In my office, I do a lot of testing, so I do a full blood panel, and I do um, stool testing as my basic tests because I want to see: Do you have parasites? Do you have H. pylori, a, a nasty bacteria? Do you have candida, or do you have yeast or overgrowth that you're going to be feeding with your food? Um, and then we look at blood sugars. I look at 10, all 10 markers of a thyroid panel because I want to see where your thyroid is your furnace on. Are you able to burn? If not, you eat according to that. And we might, we might, might put your carbohydrate, uh, intake a little less than somebody who's at full board, who's burning, um, efficiently. So I want to just dive in real quick to H. pylori and SIBO because I had a guest, I think maybe even when we were talking later and she was saying, you know, for the, and she was a functional medicine doctor and she said, you know, for the people that I have that are not feeling good, they might have brain fog. They just overall don't feel great. She's like 70% of them. I come to find out they have H. pylori or SIBO. It's just like so prevalent these days. So I want to dive into that for just a second because how does that affect your weight loss and how does that affect how you're feeling and what are some of the symptoms? So if someone says, you know, I've never heard of H. pylori or SIBO, what are they and what are some of those symptoms? So H. pylori is a bacteria and um, in I test pretty much everybody for it in my office. And I think the statistics are 40 to 60%, which I would concur with. Um, I see that in my office. And some people are completely asymptomatic. So they have zero symptoms at all. Some people will have some nausea, some vomiting, loose stools, diarrhea. um, And so it sort of is a big spectrum. And some of those people have major chronic bloating. Um, when you're looking at H. pylori, I look at virulence factors and there are several, there's about eight virulence factors. And so I test for those. If you have virulence factors, which most, most people don't, I would say 98% of the people do not have virulence factors, but occasionally we find somebody who does, those people are pretty sick. They are usually very symptomatic. Those can lead to peptic ulcers and gastric cancers. So colon cancer, things like that. So you really want to always check for H. pylori because it's sort of one of those silent things that could really cause a lot of wreckage if you don't look. Um, I do extensive stool testing. Uh, We test for 86 pathogens, worms, parasites, um, uh, candida, all different C. diff and um, E. coli, things like that, because those are things that 
um, opportunistic bacteria is that will, if they get high enough, like H. pylori, they're going to cause a lot of destruction and it's very hard to find it. Most people who come into my office who have digestive issues, who've already been to the GI, they've been tested maybe for four things, Giardia, H. pylori, things like that. And then they come in and they go, I, I don't feel any better. And the doctor says, I'm fine. Uh, we take a pretty deep, deep dive into it. I also look at see, are you making your own pancreatic enzymes? Are you having fat malabsorption issues? How do you respond to gluten? Things like that. So I have a really good look from for somebody um, on the inside once I finish all their blood and stool testing. As far as SIBO is concerned, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And it's basically when a bacteria parks itself in the small intestines. So what happens is um, that, that bacteria that should be parked in the large intestine gets fermented, right? So it, high fiber foods will tend to ferment it and may, basically saying that it causes a lot of gas production. Methanobacteria say is a, is a is a bacteria that we cause that causes methane gas to produce. Um, again, in my stool test, I'm typically seeing a high bacillus and a high methanobacteria say to conclude that there is SIBO. But if you have bloating and if you have either constant uh, constipation or constant diarrhea, you're likely to have SIBO. And so in, with SIBO, um, those are the people that we I put on a low FODMAP diet. So um, so we take out those high fermented foods that are causing that gas. SIBO is a little tricky to treat because everybody's different. If you have a really hard case, it takes a while and it's very recurring. Some people do well with a single treatment. Some people need, um, there's antibiotics for Faximin. Uh, some people will start there and then do a, uh, a low FODMAP diet along with a supplement protocol that I recommend in my office. And we see amazing results with that. So talk to us a little bit about what a low FODMAP diet is and what are some of the foods that they can have on that? So low FODMAP is, 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 is designed to be an el elimination diet. So it's about 30 to 90 days. Some people will stay on a low FODMAP type of diet because they'll see immediately when they eat the foods that they shouldn't be eating, they'll have bloating. So, um, so basically what we're doing is we're taking out some fiber. So some of the most offensive foods, if you eat these foods and you blow, you pretty much probably have SIBO. It's um, onions. That's a big one. Garlic. Um, some people will respond to avocado. Some people can have a quarter of an avocado be fine. A half an avocado just destroys them. Uh, cruciferous vegetables tend to be difficult. So broccoli and cauliflower, those are the two main culprits, but Brussels sprouts can do it too. Sometimes kale. Um, and what we find with low FODMAP, I mean, it's always best to eat animal protein, so it's tough if you're vegan, but we take out grains and legumes um, and um, most dairy, and some sweeteners are tough, so it, it's it's quite an extensive list, but it's, um, but but some, so anyway, if you, if you go on the low FODMAP, um, I always recommend it does not, it's, it's not perfect for everybody. So if you're good with two Brussels sprouts, um, then stick with two Brussels sprouts, but it really is sort of a portion control situation. So um, like at the beginning, the first week I say, go very, very strict. So don't have any cruci cruciferous vegetables. And then week two, start with one um, Brussels sprout or one asparagus or you know a little bit of cauliflower and then work your way up and you'll know your body will tell you when it's ready. So if you're doing that concurrently with some supplement protocol and you're dying off the 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 bacteria then you just have to sort of play it like that. Um some great foods for SIBO as I mentioned animal protein, um zucchini, um spinach, leafy greens, those are usually pretty good good big salads things like that. So it's it, low FODMAP is tough, but it's not forever. And as I said, every week, it just sort of starts to loosen up a little bit. So Dave Asprey did a very controversial episode on why kale was so bad for you. And did you hear about that? Didn't, but now I'm going to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> but he really just talked about why that 
oxalates and some of the things that are in just the oxalic acid form in kale. It It's to protect kale from, you know, animals and insects and fungi. And so he just talks about how if you're going to have kale, you should at least cook the vegetables. Can you talk a little bit about how some people really do better if they are cooking their vegetables? Yeah. So, um, there's a couple aspects to that. So, uh, so high oxalate foods are hard to digest and, um, it's rare that I see people have issues with oxalate foods, but, um, those people for sure, I would cook them. The other reason why people need to eat vegetables that are cooked is when you don't have enough digestive enzymes. If you don't have an acidic environment in your gut, how are you going to break it down? So we all produce our own pancreatic enzymes and hydrochloric acid from the time we're born to the time we die. But as we age, we produce and excrete less and less. So we're left with a very unacidic environment, right? And that is basically like putting a vacancy sign up at the front door saying, anybody come on in. I have this really alkalized environment. You can live here. I'm going to feed you bread, sugar, dairy, and alcohol, and you're going to thrive, right? They create biofilm, they create colonies, and the biofilm loves to be social. And next thing you know, you're sick, right? Right? So what we do is um, we need to have digestive enzymes. So I, I usually recommend around 50 years old, sometimes a little earlier. And I have plenty of people that I work with right now who are 25 years old that I have on digestive enzymes. If you're taking a lot of antibiotics or if you have a lot of stress, if you're B deficient, zinc deficient, you're not making your own digestive enzymes. So you need that acidic environment, not only just to break down our food, but again, to put the no vacancy sign up and saying you cannot live here. So a virus cannot live in a, in a microbiome that will not host it. So I'm a big proponent of, of digestive enzymes. Raw foods have a lot of enzymes that you can break down, like nuts, for instance, have enzymes to help you break down. But green leafies and um, but like kale, um, Swiss chard, things like that, not lettuce so much, but um, oh, other green leafies like those. And vegetables should are, are very difficult to break down, especially if you have a compromised gut. So uh, digestive enzymes, but yeah, always lightly cook. You don't have to kill it till it's wilted, you know, fully wilting, and um, but just slightly cook. So at least you're still getting the minerals and the uh, vitamins in there. So what foods would you say are kind of a staple in your diet? So if we wanted to talk about like a typical lunch that you would eat or a typical dinner that you would have, what would that look like for you? I am all about protein, fat, and fiber. So pretty much every meal has always protein, fat, and fiber. So protein could be a clean animal protein. I don't tend to do a lot of um, vegetarian um, proteins like grains and, and legumes. I was a vegan for, for many years, but I noticed that my blood work, um, my sugars were elevating and um, it, it wasn't helping me. So I have a clean animal protein, not too much, um, about three to six ounces. And then I have pretty much unlimited vegetables. So I have a big green leafy salad at least once a day. Um, and then I always start my morning off with a shake, a collagen shake, um, when, and I stick some chia seeds or flax seeds or greens in there. Um, and always a good fat coconut cream I use all the time. Um, that's my main go-to. It doesn't really have any carbohydrates. Sometimes I'll have avocado or you can do a nut butter, almond butter, something like that. Um, so lunch is typically a salad for me with as many vegetables as, you know, I have available And then I always stick some kind of fat. So whether it's an avocado or olives or a sprinkling of nuts and seeds, um, I will do that as well. And my salad dressing always has a good avocado oil or um, olive oil. And then my dinners are pretty much the exact same thing. Last night I made sea bass tacos, which were so good. And I made guacamole and salsa from scratch and... um, I put it on lettuce cups, butter lettuce cups, and um, had that. And I started off with a um, my French onion soup. So um, it was always it sounds good. delicious. Oh, so good. So good. So give us some other things that you say that you try to avoid out of your diet. And then what would you say as far as like, if you said, if I'm going to have a carb or I'm going to have this, you know, this is how often I have it. 
So, um, things that I avoid, I do not typically eat any grains at all. Um, that's what we use for cattle to make them fat. So I typically stay away from them. We don't really have a lot of nutrients in them. And, um, that's what I call in my sections food for sport, right? We eat mostly food for survival. We have to eat a little food for sport because life wouldn't be so fun if we didn't. Right. But, um, if I'm in Italy, I'm going to eat some, some, some grains, right? Some carbs there, because that's for sure food for fun. Um, but typically I don't eat any grains at all. Um, I don't eat legumes anymore, really. Very, very rarely if I'm somewhere and there's some lentils or hummus, garbanzo beans, I'll enjoy a little bit, but it's a, it's a rarity for me. Um, and, um, and I stay away from sugar for sure. I don't have any um, real sugar. I have a lot of uh, things sweetened with allulose, my new favorite sweetener, uh, monk fruit or stevia, um, but I tend not to be very sweet oriented. Um, and I stay away from uh, any processed foods, any processed oils. I'm really picky about my oils. So um, I use olive oil, uh, coconut oil, uh, sesame oil, and, um, um, and, and all of, oh, did I say olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, and sesame oil. Those are pretty much the oils that I use. All different sort of processed oils are really highly inflammatory. So I stay away from those as best I can. If I go out to dinner, I don't know what kind of oil they're using in the restaurant, but um, you know, we all have to live. So I'm not crazy about stuff like that. Um, and so I don't do any junk food, processed foods, um, fast foods, things like that. I don't have any dairy either. Dairy doesn't really work well for me. Um, some people can tolerate some dairy occasionally, very rarely I'll have goat cheese, but goat cheese and feta cheese are typically much better, easier to digest. So those are the ones I recommend to people who can tolerate dairy. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantalrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. So explain a little bit more about the food frame for people who just give us a little bit more of an, a glimpse of what that food frame method is. Sure. So basically you take a, a quiz online uh, on my website and you uh, just answer, there's 12 questions and you realize what we're, what diet type is best for you. Now I use, I use the tagline diet is a four letter word because I cannot stand the word diet, right? We have all these connotations. I'm sure you do too, right? When you think diet, you think, oh my God, deprivation, right? And cardboard, food, and um, just all this um, not fun, right? And then this is goal to just lose weight. Is that that's what we consider a diet, right? I, it is diet. I wish I could come up with a different word, and I've tried and I've thought about it forever. But diet is really our eating lifestyle, right? So I use eating lifestyle a lot in my book, and and every person is different. So. I might have an athlete that I'm working with who's burning a ton of calories and needs a little bit more carbohydrates for fuel. So that person we're going to depend, you know, and depending on what their blood work looks like or what their stool test looks like and if they have any health concerns, right? If they have diabetes or they're pre-diabetic, I'm going to tend to to put somebody more on a keto diet because keto really helps stabilize blood sugars. Paleo does too. So that's where I would say, mm, you know, well, let's take the quiz and see how you are. You know, if you're having bloating, a uh, constant bloating, if you're having chronic diarrhea or chronic constipation, I'm going to tend to, to recommend low FODMAP for you. Um, and then I, I, and everybody on the food frame method starts off with my detox. So I have a Risa Green Nutrition detox and it is a collagen based detox. And you're having two shakes a day, every day. And then you're eating basically a paleo diet because across the board, most people do best with paleo, meaning animal protein, uh, unlimited vegetables, good fats, nuts, seeds, eggs, and sweet potato and yams. So um, that's basically what they're eating on the detox. They're eating food and two shakes a day, and it's not calorie de de deprived. So if you are hungry, I want you to eat. It has nothing to do with starvation. So we, we, I do the detox, it's 14 days. 
everybody loses weight, but I don't do it as a weight loss program. I do it to clean out the liver, to get rid of some fatty liver. Toxins live in fat cells. That's why we lose weight because once we get the toxins out of the system, people do lose weight. Everybody does, but they feel great and they've gotten the gluten and the dairy and the sugar out of their diet. So it's a great kickstart uh, for two weeks and then you follow whichever program. So we have uh, six different programs and vegan, um, low FODMAP, uh, low lectin, we talk about lectins a lot, and then um, uh, paleo and keto and um, and AIP, uh, um, autoimmune protocol. So anyone who has autoimmune or has autoimmune in the family and suspects they may have it, that would be a great uh, program for them. I want to really address this issue, what we talked about of, you know, that people say, well, I might be doing intermittent fasting or I might be doing keto and I'm not losing weight. And I want to really have you dive into some of the reasons why, because one of the things I see, like I had, was having lunch with someone and she was doing a keto diet and she was having like, you know, eight pieces of bacon. And then she was also eating, like I was watching her eat nuts. So she was eating like it, it seemed like almost like two cups of nuts, you know, and so nuts are whole foods and, but they're also very high in fat. And so their almonds are around 50% fat. So yes, nuts have a high energy density, but it's very easy to overeat nuts And so you could, you know, without almost mindlessly just, you know, kind of going crazy on it or having nut butters that, you know, have a massive amount of calories and they might be having like, you know, tablespoons of that to kind of prevent the weight loss. So kind of dive in a little bit of someone saying, you know, I'm doing keto or I'm doing this and here's some of those big red flags of why they're not losing weight. Great question. So nuts, first of all, have carbohydrates. So absolutely portion is huge. So I say one handful maximum a day because you will overdose on carbohydrates if you just keep going. And like you said, I mean, how easy is it for people to just keep um, snacking on those on those nuts, all nuts of any kind? So we have to watch our intake on that. There is really no free food, right? Um, so... Um, As far as intermittent fasting and keto, both of those will help stabilize blood sugar. So if you have any uh, insulin resistance or prediabetes or diabetes, that is a great one for you. But again, I don't know your health status completely, so it may not work for you. So I want to discuss the five reasons why we do not lose weight. Because I see people come in here, I'm usually the last stop, they're frustrated, they've done everything, they work out, and and they're just not moving the needle. And I get it, I was there, I totally understand that frustration is so real, you just want to cry and just say, forget it, you know, where's my bag of chips and salsa, right? Um, It's very frustrating. So there's five reasons why we don't lose weight. First one is blood sugar dysregulation. That is big. If we cannot, if we if we give the body too much sugar, it will take whatever the cell will take whatever it needs to make ATP in the mitochondria. That's our energy cells, and and the rest it will just park into fat cells, right, and fat tissues. If we are insulin resistant, we cannot penetrate the cell. That means the receptors are broken, so we immediately efficiently gain weight. We just park it right into fat tissues and fat cells. So those are two reasons why we gain weight with blood sugar. The way we lose weight is if we give the body less energy that it needs, less sugar, less carbohydrates, carbohydrates turn into sugar and insulin is pumped out of the pancreas and it converts it into glycogen. So it puts it into the cell. If we have too little glycogen going into the cell, then the body needs, it requires some energy. So it has no choice but to pull from the fat storage and use that, that's how we lose weight. So blood sugar is a huge factor. And again, most people, when they go to the doctor, they get a glucose, fasting glucose, they don't get a hemoglobin A1C to tell them how high their blood sugars are for the last three months. They don't get a a, a fasting insulin and they don't get a C-peptide, an insulin marker. Those are the four markers that I test for. So blood sugar is a thing. You will have a very difficult time losing weight if you have high blood sugar levels. 
The second thing is thyroid and thyroid is huge. It's really sort of like the master gland. It's the key to the castle, right? It, 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 it tells us if we're burning, right? If our furnace is on or our furnace is off. Most people come in here with labs from doctors that are very incomplete. I test for all 10 markers of the thyroid. I want to know um, your, your, your inactive thyroid cells are your T4, right? That's 93% of the deal. That needs to convert into T3. T3 is your active thyroid hormone. It's only 7% of the deal. We want to know your free T3, meaning free is your unbound. It's what's usable. T free T3 is the star of the show. The people who walk into my office day after day, hour after hour, who say, I've done everything, I work out, I eat barely any food, I, you know, and I'm tired and I, I can't lose weight and I'm really, it's easy to gain weight. Those are the people I always say, your free T3 is less than three. It has to be in the twos or e even lower. So it means your furnace isn't on. So the thyroid is complex. There's lots of reasons. We have a reverse T3, which gets cortisol into the picture. So if you're highly stressed, that cortisol is gonna start reversing your T3. If you have a T3 uptake, that means estrogen is competing for that thyroid site. And if you're estrogen dominant, that is gonna throw things off as well. We'll see it in the thyroid. And then of course I look for antibodies to the thyroid to see if you're in autoimmunity. So thyroid is a big one. The second one is- Before you move on from that, let me just, I'd love for you to give people, if let's say they go to their primary care physician and their primary care physician is really great and exceptional, which is hard to find these days. And let's say they do all of the different you know, tests where they're doing you know, T3, they're doing T4, they're doing all of that. Can you give them the formula for them to look of how to calculate your free T3? So I like got ra the ratio of the free T3 to the reverse T3. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I will. It's very complete in my book. I have it written uh, all about each marker and what, what the ideal ranges are, what the lab ranges are and, and all that. But um, I'll give a, a brief story of it here. So again, it's very complex. It starts in the brain in the pituitary, which is the size and shape of a pea, and that produces TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. TSH goes through the liver. This is why we detox and we create T4. So that's our inactive thyroid hormone, as we mentioned. T4 needs to convert into T3. That conversion is really important. And then, then that's the star of the show. So what we're looking at, when we look at hormones, we're looking at total and free. Free means it's unbound. That's what's usable to us. And total gives us a really good idea because it's both the free and the um, what's bound. And it gives us a good idea for guidance, right? So Ideally, we want men and women to be between 3.5 and 4.0 for their free T3. Those are the people who come in my office. I have one gal I'm working with now. She comes in and we laugh. I look at her food log and I'm thinking, there's no way she's losing weight this week. There's no way. She's had donuts. She's had alcohol. She's had cookies. She gets on the scale and we just start laughing. She's like down four pounds. Like her T3 is, I think it's a 3.8. It, it's not going to matter. Little kids who eat, who are never cold at night when they're running around at night, those people are people with a good T3, right? So when it goes low, we start to get cold extremities. We're always cold. We run cold. Our hands are cold. Our feet are cold. The outside of our eyebrows start to fade. Our hair starts thinning. Our nails are weak and brittle. We perhaps we have some constipation, anxiety, depression, Um and uh, sometimes we have trouble sleeping. So those are typical thyroid symptoms. So if you have those symptoms, you should absolutely get checked and get checked for your free T3 and your total T3, along with your total T4 and, to and free T4. So we like our T4, our, um, we like it to be in the eights, but the so but this is where it gets really tricky because somebody i could see somebody in the sixes who's converting effectively and it doesn't really matter that they're at six they're just converting really really well so when we look at an, a thyroid i'm always looking uh, are you having a production issue are you having a processing issue are you having a conversion issue or are you having a, a cortisol or an estrogen issue or are you having antibodies so there's a lot of questions, it's very complex and they're very tied to each other. If people are on thyroid medication like Synthroid, which is a very, very popular medication, it's a synthetic T4. 
So the doctor's giving it to you going, I hope it converts. I hope it converts, right? So some people do, but it's rare. I saw one this week that was actually converting. I was so surprised because it's very rare. But so again, there's so many different types of medication for a thyroid, but you should really always look at these numbers and I look at them through functional guidelines because the, the the lab ranges tend to be really wide. Um, so if you're out of lab range, you should definitely do something about your thyroid. And I would see an, a functional endo, endocrinologist or functional doctor or a naturopath to help with that. Now, when you're looking for something sweet, let's say you're like, okay, I'm craving something sweet. And I looked at your website. It's beautiful, by the way. And it looks like you've got some really great recipes on there. But what is it that you kind of turn to if you go, okay, I don't want to have sugar. I know that's, you know, sugar beget, sugar beget, sugar, but I want something sweet. What is your go-to? So I'm a big fan of dark chocolate because it's got polyphenols. It's got really good properties in it, magnesium. Um, and so I like things sweetened with monk fruit. Um, so monk fruit is a natural sugar. It's uh, from China. It's called Luhan Gao from China. And it's become very popular in America in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of the monk fruit that we see is cut with erythritol, which is a sugar alcohol. So if you've got SIBO, you got to stay away from that. That's going to make you bloat. If you have too much of it, it's going to make anybody bloat. Um, but uh, I, I tend to go with dark chocolate. That That's my go-to. Um, pretty much hands down, that's it. I saw on your site you have these tahini chocolate chip cookies. Are those good? Do you eat them often? or? I just actually made them. So I, I they will be on my regular list. Everybody loved them in my house, so they went very quickly. So, yeah, I'll make those over and over and over again. Awesome. I just love made it. A raspberry mousse. I don't know if you saw that. Um, it's with my my vanilla collagen and it's got, uh, I used allulose, which is mm. a great sweetener and it doesn't spike blood sugar levels at all. There's no gastric upset. It's a really great, there's no carbohydrates. It's really almost like a free food. There's mm. no calories. It's great. We don't really digest it. It goes through the system, but it's really sweet and it's great. It doesn't taste artificial because it isn't. And um, so I used allulose with that raspberry mousse. It's really, really good. Love it. Well, tell us about what you have coming up and all of the things that you're offering to our listeners. So I have my book coming out this summer, Food Frame. Um, and, uh, I'm really excited about that. And, uh, I have a whole product line. I have my detox and collagen. I have collagen bars and fiber bars and tons of, uh, supplements that I think are essential vitamin D vitamin B. Uh, there's a common gene mutation MTHFR, um, that many people have up to 90% of the population has it. I have it, both my kids have it. And it means that you just are not methylating, um, not processing your B12 and or your folate, which is really important because a lot of people come in here, it causes anxiety, depression, ADD, uh, ADHD, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, uh, headaches, migraines, uh, infertility, and miscarriages. So you have to have a methylcobalamin form of a B vitamin. So I have that. Um, I have a whole product line. Um, I have a new product called um, Immune Ultra, and it's great. It's just lozenges that you suck on, and um, they're just zinc and uh, elderberry. That's it. And so it's great. I leave them on the kitchen counter, and everybody just grabs them throughout the day. We have them in the office all the time. I give them to everybody who walks in. And it's a great immune booster. So who doesn't need that, right? Um, awesome. But I finish on the five things why we can't lose weight because we okay. got we got stuck at two. Yes. So, oh, yes. Yes. We got sidetracked. So blood sugar, thyroid, cortisol is the third one. Cortisol is our stress hormone that we produce from our adrenal glands. So if we're overworked, if we're, we're underslept, we're, we're eating a bad diet, we're drinking too much, we've got a lot of stress. Cortisol is a huge factor. I see this with a lot of CEOs that I work with who just, just can't shut it off. And they will have a, it's almost impossible to lose weight with high or low cortisol. The other one is sex hormones, as I had mentioned. So if your sex hormones, your estrogen, testosterone, progesterone are out of balance, we're going to have a really, really hard time losing weight until that happens. Um, 
And then the other one is uh, toxin, so toxic buildup. So that's why I always recommend the detox. But those are the five major reasons why we don't lose weight. The other reason, which is not as major, but when we have disease in the body, if there is uh, a high level of mold or um, heavy metals or things like that, if there's some kind of chronic disease, there's a candida, there's an Epstein-Barr virus, there's a, a cytomegalovirus, things like that, your body is trying to protect it and it will hold on to the fat as long as it possibly can. So it protects. And, you know, I say to people all the time in my office, it's kind of like thinking there's a fire in the basement of your house and you've got somebody on the second floor saying, hey, could you help me change the light bulb? And you're like, light bulb? We've got a fire in the basement, right? So that's exactly what's happening is your body is trying to address something pretty critical and you're going, could you just lose some weight for me, please? You know, so it's this really secondary type of um, issue that we don't, um, that we shouldn't be focusing on and it's going to prevent us from losing weight. Awesome. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. This was amazing and we really appreciate it. And you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.